Hi, it's Penny. Um, so I have some news to share with you about what's going on at church right now. So first, um, before we get started, let's go ahead and light a chalice like we do in RE class. You can repeat after me. Love surrounds the chalice and we are included by the light of the chalice. Good, that was good. Okay, before we get started, let's take a few deep breaths, okay? So take one in, and it out. One more time. And one more time. That was good, good. That always makes me feel a little bit grounded um, when there's a lot going on. So some of you probably have heard um, that there is a lot going on right now. Um, there's an illness going around called COVID-19 or coronavirus. It can make people sick and it's contagious, um, which makes it spread very quickly. Um, and that's why you all are not in school right now. Um, because of this illness is going around and it can spread quickly, we've made the decision to close the church for a while. So there'll be no RE in person um, for now. It was an easy decision, but it was the right one. And I'll tell you why. So even though this is different and maybe even a bit scary, it is a really amazing opportunity to practice our UU values. We're going to talk today specifically about our first and seventh principles, or what we call promises. Um, so our first principle, we respect the inherent worth and dignity of all beings, or, and as we say in class, each person is important. And then our seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we all are a part, or what we say in RE, we care for Earth's lifeboat. When we say each person is important, we also mean that everyone deserves to be safe and have what they need. Everyone deserves to have that, no matter who they are, uh, where they're from, what they believe, um, or where they are in their journey. The illness can affect anyone. But most likely, uh, just it'll seriously impact people who are older or already have medical conditions. So even though some of us who are younger and healthier aren't likely to get seriously sick, our friends who are more likely to get seriously sick deserve to be as safe as possible. And that means that all of us, even those of us who are less likely to get sick, need to be very careful I'm washing our hands, which I'm sure you've heard from your parents or guardians and at school, and spending as much time as we can away from public and crowds. And I know that's hard and it's not really fun. It's, it isn't necessarily because we're worried about getting sick ourselves, but because uh, we want to decrease the chances of carrying the illness to someone who could get very sick, right? Those people deserve to be safe and well, and it's up to us to remember that each person is important. And honoring that right now means that we have to change the way we do some things, like not having RE in person. And so that brings us to our seventh principle. Because we live in an interdependent web of existence, interdependent means we all depend on each other, it is up to all of us to do what we can to make sure our vulnerable friends are safe, right? We all have to do our part to hold the web together, and each and every part matters. We all depend on one another every day, and this situation is a big reminder of that. I know in many of our classes, we've, we've held a string to be like a spider web, and if someone lets it go, then the whole web kind of falls apart. And so today, and moving forward, what we're doing is holding the web for each other and taking care of each other. And I know it isn't necessarily fair, and all the adults in your life, your parents and guardians, your teachers, church staff, um, and beyond, 
recognize that asking you to change your routines and seeing your friends and playing, you know, at parks um, and not having any certainty about what's going on, we realize that doesn't seem fair and it's not fun for you. It's okay to feel that way or to feel worried or even angry. We understand when we're going to give you love and support um, as well as do our parts to help our community. So you all know that most of you know that Mr. Rogers is from this area. So uh, one thing Mr. Rogers said about when he saw scary things happening, which some of you might think this is pretty scary, when he saw things scary happening when he was younger, he remembers his mother saying, he said, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words, and I'm always confronted by realizing that there are still so many helpers, so many caring people in the world. So we all have a chance to be helpers now, and so do the grown-ups in helping keep you safe too. So we're going to do RE online. Um, just like this with videos each week um, and so that was kind of like an introduction about what we're going to do um, and I would like to go ahead and go into a lesson now kind of like what we do in RE. So we're going to be focusing on how love surrounds us okay so um, we've already taken some deep breaths but let's go ahead put our hands here take one more breath and push your arms up and then bring them down and give yourself a big hug. Okay, good. So, we are going to learn a song that tells us how the spirit surrounds us um, with a message of love. So, I am going to attempt to sing. This is not one of my skills. But bear with me. I'm going to send this, um, actually, the words to your uh, parents and guardians, and I'm going to challenge you all to record the song, if you can, and send it to me on the Facebook group. Here's the song. Love surrounds us, this I know, for my spirit tells me so. All of us to love belong. Fill our hearts and make us strong. Yes, love surrounds us. Yes, love surrounds us. Yes, love surrounds us. My spirit tells me so. So now we're going to read a story. And we always read a story in RE usually uh, before we talk about our lesson. And this story is actually about a really wise young girl. Her name is Selamai, and um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and start. So a long, long time ago in the country of China lived a young woman of the Muslim we people whose name was Selamai. Although she was a farm girl too poor to attend school, Selamai nonetheless paid, played, paid close attention to life around her. When an old woman in the village needed help but was too proud to ask for it, Salamai would know just the right time to visit. When children scraped their knees, Sal Salamai arrived to assist, even if they were not her own children. She may have been poor and unschooled, but Salamai possessed a wise and a deep heart. Hmm. Once her father-in-law, a carpenter, named Ali, was ordered by the emperor to make some repairs in his palace. Feel, fearful of doing less than his best for the emperor, Ali pushed himself to work his very hardest, working both day and night, yet, as it sometimes happens, the time came when Ali went beyond his limits. Dizzy with fatigue, hands shaking, momentarily careless, he tipped over the emperor's most precious face. The pieces shattered all too loudly in the great hall, and servants came running. Soon enough, the emperor heard the story of his ruined, priceless vase. 
Bring this carpenter to me at once, he demanded. Handcuffed and escorted by three guards, Ali, trembling, stood speechless before the emperor. The emperor drew his sword as it hovered over Ali's head. Ali at last spoke up. Forgive me, your worship. I did not mean to break the vase. I promise to pay for it. I promise to pay. I promise to pay. The emperor lowered his sword just a bit. A poor old we like yourself could never replace such a treasure. Do not jest me. Have mercy, Ali begged. I will pay. The emperor resheathed his sword with a sly smile. Very well, old we. I do not expect you to replace my vase. Instead, I will give you ten days to find me four things. The emperor hesitated and thought, tugging lightly on his beard. The first thing you must get me is something more black than the bottom of a pan. Second, you must find me something clearer than a mirror. The emperor waited a moment, watching Ali's reaction, but Ali stared blankly at the floor. The emperor continued, the third, something stronger than steel, the emperor smirked, and lastly, find me something as vast as the sea. If you fail at any of these, I will chop off your head. Finished, the emperor smiled broadly, quite pleased with himself. Ali looked stricken. How, he wondered, could I achieve these impossible tasks? Does the emperor simply wish to torture me for my last ten days of life? Sick with dread, he hung his head, turned away, and headed home. For the next week, he could neither eat nor sleep. His family knew that something was terribly amiss, but Ali would not discuss it. Please, father, father Salami said, calling her father-in-law by the customary term of respect. What is the trouble? Perhaps we can help. Begging and pleading, Salami at last coaxed Ali into talking. He cradled his head between his hands and wept as he named the emperor's four impossible tasks. But Salami responded as if these were everyday requests. This isn't a problem, father. Don't worry. I have all of these things. When the emperor comes tomorrow, I shall present them to him myself. Ali assumed that Salami was trying only to comfort her, him. He didn't want her to get um, in trouble with the emperor, too. Don't be foolish, Salami, he warned. These four things do not exist. The emperor just wanted me to suffer furthermore before killing me. Salami persisted. Father, I really do have these things. I know you don't believe me now, but wait until tomorrow. I will show them to both you and the emperor. And so it was the very next day, the tenth day since the broken vase. The emperor appeared surrounded by troops at Ali's door. Old we, come forward and give to me the four things you owe me, bellowed the emperor. Ali came outside with Salami by his side. They both bowed humbly, never daring to meet the, the emperor's gaze. Salami then stepped forward. Your majesty, she said, the four things you requested are ready to be presented. Please name them one by one. The first thing I must have? said so the emperor, is that what is more black than the bottom of a pan? He touched his sheath of his sword with a glint in his eye. Salami answered, This, your majesty, can be found in the bottomless, greedy heart. The emperor hid his surprise. The girl, he reassured himself, cannot be so smart. She's a farm girl. He nodded briefly. The next thing you must present is something more clear than a mirror. Do you have that? he asked. Salami answered, yes. Knowledge offers a clarity greater than any mirror. The emperor looked dumbstruck. Well, he stammered, do you have something stronger than steel to give me? Love, said Salami, is the strongest thing in the world. Knowing he had been bested, the emperor stood speechless. Ali glanced at Salami and stood a little taller. 
At last, the emperor cleared his throat and made his last request. <clears throat> and what do you have that could possibly be as vast as the sea? He asked. A virtuous heart is as vast as the sea, your majesty. Her head lowered. Salami smiled and said nothing more. Flustered and humbled, the emperor sputtered. It's time to leave, old we. You are you hear you are hereby pardoned. He turned to his troops and shouted, March As the Emperor of China descended himself dis, distanced himself, Salmai held her father in law's hand, and together she and Ali bowed in relief and gratitude to Allah. Because of Salmai's wise heart, Ali could now live a long and happy life. So, what do we learn from this story? Let's think about it. So why, and you guys can talk about this with your parents or somebody, if you have a sibling, a brother or sister sitting with you, uh, why did Salami help her uncle? Would you have helped your father-in-law? Uh, how did the king feel when Salami knew all the answers? And what did Salami learn about being a part of a community? And what did Salami teach her father-in-law and the king about love? So these are some questions to ask. Would you have helped your father-in-law? And how did the king feel when the young Salami knew the answers? And what did Salami learn about being part of a community? And what did Salama teach her father-in-law and the king about love? So, what we're going to do now is we are going to talk about this bowl. Okay? So, this is a big, beautiful bowl. This is actually my favorite color, but it's empty. Okay, there's nothing in it. So, actually, you know what this bowl needs? is some love. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some love in this bowl. And the love that I'm going to put in here is actually the love for some of our older members of our congregation who may be home alone, um, who may be a little nervous and scared about this illness that's going around. So, I'm just going to put a bunch of love in here for them okay and what I want you to do is I want you to think about um, what you would like to put in this bowl of love so think of something um, that you can put in here some love that you have to give okay so you guys go ahead put some in okay Good. All right, what are we gonna? What do we do with this big bowl of love? I wonder where this bowl. Where should we put it? Why can't we see the love in the bowl? Where is it? Where is that love? I wonder um, if we can ever put too much love in this bowl. Do you think that's possible to put too much love in this bowl? I mean, it's a pretty big bowl. It's pretty full. I think more could go in here. Actually, I don't think that you could put too much love in this bowl. I wonder what ways we can share this bowl of love. What can we do? Hmm. You guys think about that. So today when you're home, I want you to think about the love that you just put in here. And if you didn't put any love, I want you to take a minute when we get done and think about what love you would put in this bowl to, to and what we would do with it. So what, what would you do with the love that we put in this bowl? Uh, would you take some out and maybe give some away? Because you want to keep it for yourself, right? Um, maybe give it to maybe families or friends, to pets, maybe to the earth, to our community, our church community, our family community, our larger community. 
um, you could give it to whoever or whatever else that's important to you. So as Unitarian Universalists, we remember that love surrounds us and we can surround others with love too. And I think that's important to think about um, in this time when we're home and think about why we're home. And we talked about that at the beginning, how we're keeping ourselves safe, but we're also keeping others safe. Um, and this illness can really hurt other people. And so that's what we're doing. We're helping. So um, I will be sending your parents and guardians a little bit more active ways that you can um, give and send love um, um, that some activities that you guys can do at home that I, that I hope will be helpful and um, um, so that you can give some of that love away that you thought about earlier. So I want to thank you all for joining me today. Um, we'll be doing this again next Sunday, but I'll probably be posting a few videos here and there with some stories, and Pastor Elizabeth will be posting some things as well. Um, but before we go, I would like to... Um, extinguish our chalice like we do each Sunday and I would like you to repeat after me for extinguishing the chalice be good to yourself be excellent to others do everything with love good and before we go we'll do as we, we do in many of our classes Unitarians, Universalists, with minds that think, hearts that love, and hands that are ready to serve.